Hello, everybody. Hey. Hey, Angel. Um, my name is Christine Pearson. I'd like to welcome, to welcome you tonight on behalf of the LGBTA, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Ally Alliance. Before John Burke introduces tonight's speaker, I'd like to th take a moment to thank all of our co-sponsors. Belonging, Call to Action, Central Iowa Call to Action, and the Committee on Lectures, funded by GSB. We'd also like to encourage you to uh, attend the movie that was shown tonight. It'll be shown again tomorrow, or on Tuesday, October 16th at 7 p.m. in the South Ballroom. The video will also be on sale along with Sister Gramic's books at the reception, which she'll also be signing. Lastly, I'd like to encourage you to attend some Alliance events this week. This Thursday, we'll have our rally in the Free Speech Zone from 11 to 1. And now, here is John Burke. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, again, my name is John Burke, and I'm here to introduce Sister Jeanne Gramick on behalf of Belonging. Belonging is one of the groups, as mentioned, that is helping support her visit tonight. Um, Belonging is a gay ministry group that has been meeting at St. Thomas Catholic Church across the road for the past six years. Uh, to our knowledge, it is the only such group connected with a Catholic parish in the state of Iowa. And for that, we are grateful for the administrative staff and the parish council at St. Thomas. As I've listened to the stories of both gay and straight members in Belonging, some of whom have traveled from other towns for such an opportunity, it is clear that there is a deep feeling of being ostracized and a great deal of pain associated with being sexually different in the Catholic community. Some of us have asked ourselves, what keeps us in a tradition whose leaders refer to homosexual orientation as disordered and all homosexual acts as sinful? When many other Christian traditions have established wholesome, positive, and embracing practices toward their lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender members. Others have wrestled with the authenticity of the leadership itself that can so definitively pass judgment about the core of one's being. Most wonder, with hope, if through open dialogue and education, the larger church will recognize not only the need to be more inclusive, but how to go about it. Sister Janine Gramick has been addressing these very questions for more than three decades. After being introduced to her through our friends in Call to Action, a national organization calling for change in the Catholic Church, we knew we had to get her to Ames. Call to Action, by the way, is helping finance tonight's lecture, and its local members have been indispensably supportive of belonging. Sister Gramick, as many of you know who watched the documentary prior to this lecture, has also had to address her own unique question, whether to remain silent in regard to an injunction placed upon her as a religious nun and cease her pastoral work with the LGBT community or not. Thankfully, she chose not, not to accept church directives as the only guide in discerning what God's will is for her, not to abandon people in need, and not to allow the same cloak of silence about the LGBT community that obfuscates our understanding of human sexuality to keep her from continuing the dialogue. It is not only Sister Gramick's courage and honesty in light of this discernment that make her so remarkable. She is an inspirational role model in the art of peaceful conflict resolution, using her gift to find common ground with opponents lay a path for civil discourse, and promote reconciliation. Despite the disapproval she has drawn from the Vatican, she has been recognized for her work by several groups, including the National Coalition of American Nuns, the Loretto Community, the Paulist Community, the University of Notre Dame and St. Mary's College, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, and the American Psychological Association. She was named a 2006 Laureate of the International Mother Teresa Awards for her role as a human rights activist and continues to be in demand as a speaker throughout the United States and abroad. In 1971, Sister Gramick and Father Robert Nugent co-founded New Ways Ministry, 
an advocacy and justice ministry for lesbian and gay Catholics, and has since authored several books related to this ministry. She would like you to know also that there are several free publications over there that you may take. She also, by the way, holds a PhD in mathematics. Please help me welcome Sister Janine Gramick. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here tonight, and I uh, thank you for all the organizations that were instrumental in bringing me here, and I thank you all for coming. And I, um, I apologize to the people over here because most of the people are kind of over there, and I, I just feel like shifting the lectern over a bit, <laughs> but at any rate. Uh, how many of you did see the documentary about um, the ministry that I have been in for over 30 years? Just a, a handful. Well, I do hope uh, others of you get the opportunity because I think the filmmaker uh, did a wonderful job. Um, this, it, it was in the making for, for a number of years. Um, Barbara Rick, who's the filmmaker, came to me, or I guess emailed me, and, um, and asked if she could meet with me. Um, to request that, you know, she do this documentary. I said, well, you know, why would you want to do this? And she said, well, she had been reading in the New York Times about this nun who said no to the Vatican, and she said, and that's going to be the subject of my next documentary, you know. But she was a, she's a very fine filmmaker. She's um, uh, been working in the, in the media world for a number of years. But if you did see the movie, or will see it, you'll, there are many stories in there. And so I'd like tonight to be, for this to be a story night. We each have our stories, and uh, we have lots of stories that, that we will share, I hope, with each other and share with me. And I, I have a tendency, I don't want to talk the whole time, so I, I, you know, I want to make this dialogic. So you'll have to help me be on track. Um, but I want to share with you some some stories, um, and I'll tell you one, a few stories. But one that brought me into this ministry uh, occurred in 1971. I was a graduate student myself one day, and I was at the University of Pennsylvania, not in Iowa, uh, in Philadelphia, and I met a gay man at a home liturgy. Now. My background, as you know, is is Catholic, so I don't know if um, if I say some things that you don't understand religious wise. Just you know, raise your hand and I'll I'll explain. But uh, this was a home mass. This was back in the 1971 when the Catholic Church was going through a, a period of renewal, and we were celebrating a lot of liturgies in people's houses, and there was a young man there. Um, and it was a con-celebrated liturgy. There, were, uh, there was an Episcopal priest and a Roman Catholic priest, and so the Episcopal community had a number of people, and then the Roman community had some people. And after this con-celebrated liturgy, I found myself speaking uh, with this young man. This was the days where I had a veil, you know. And this was before the nuns kicked the habit, so to speak. And uh, this um, young man came over to me, attracted by the veil, I think. And he shared with me his story. And his story is probably similar if you have gay or lesbian friends, or if you are lesbian or gay yourself, or bisexual, transgendered. You know some of the oppression that you have faced, or that your friends have faced. And he shared with me um, some of his story. And in the course of uh, some years following, I, I learned more of his story. I mean, he, he had been in a religious order, in the Catholic Church and ultimately left feeling it was irreconcilable with who he was as a gay person. And it, we now know that's not true, but that's what he felt. And he was attending the Episcopal Church on campus at the university. So he came to this concelebrated liturgy as, at the invitation of the Episcopal Church. And he had grown up as a Roman Catholic. But he felt so alienated from his, the church of his home, you know, of, of his uh, upbringing. And that evening and subsequent 
you know, uh, times, um, we developed a close friendship. And he asked me what the Catholic Church was doing for his gay brothers and sisters. Well, here I was, this very naive, in those days, very young uh, nun, uh, not knowing really what the Catholic Church was doing. I, I barely had heard the word homosexual. Um, so what he asked me to do was to get involved. It was kind of a gentle probing. And for those of us here who are allies of our GLBT friends, you know that personal encounter, that personal encounter where God seems to be tapping you on the shoulder through someone else. And that's what happened in my life. God was tapping on my shoulder through Dominic. So we began to meet on a weekly basis at his apartment, and we had, uh, we celebrated a, a, a liturgy, a, a worship service for Dominic and his friends. And this was the beginning, I think, of a lot of healing for these GLBT folks who had felt so alienated from their religion, but not from God. They, they felt close to God, but felt that their home, their spiritual home, had rejected them. And so we began a time of healing. Now, it, um, it was probably several months um, when we, after we had been having these uh, liturgies, these Eucharists, and Dominic was, God bless him, indomitable and um, very out there, very public, as we should be. If something is good, why do you hide it under the bushel? You know, why do you put it in the closet? If something is good and wonderful, you shout it from the housetops. So Dominic went to the local newspaper and uh, talked to the uh, reporters at the newspaper and said, here's this nun, you know, meeting with gays. So um, there was a, an article in the local newspaper about this nun meeting in the convent, you know, and uh, with gays. And my um, parents happened to live in, in Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, where the University of Pennsylvania is. And uh, the day, now I hadn't said anything to my parents about my uh, involvement with the gay community. Now I had said something to my religious uh, leaders, and uh, they were very supportive. They said, do whatever needs to be done, whatever you can do, because the, the church, my church, has been at fault in neglecting this large group of people, and my community leader said, do what you can to, to be of, of help. But I hadn't said anything to my parents. So uh, the day that the newspaper article appeared happened to be a day when I was going to be visiting with my parents. And, uh, and my dad, whom I uh, dearly love, and if those of you have seen the, the film, he's, he's in there. My dad said to me, what's this about your meeting with homosexuals? And I said, well, yes, that's what I'm doing. I met some at the university, and we're meeting for Eucharist. And, and my dad said, well, well, why are you doing that? And I said, well, somebody in the church needs to reach out because they're part of the church, and we have to let everyone feel welcome. It's, it's their church as well as, as our church. And my dad said, well, why don't you let the other nuns do it? <laughs> and then, now, this is 1971, before most of you in this room were born, and um, it was the height of the uh, Vietnam War and the peace activists um, demonstrating, and my, my dad said, well, are you going to go and burn any draft records? And, uh, and I said, I considered, and I said, well, I support the peace movement, but probably I won't take that kind of action. I'm not heavily involved in the peace movement, direct, that directly involved. And he said, oh, okay, good. And I said, well, now, what if I did? And he said, well, you know, that's against our country. 
But if you did it, it would be okay because you're our daughter. And to me, now that, that part of the story did not make it into the movie, but I, I really wanted to share that with you because to me it's a very important story in my own life because it says to me, it's an example to me of God's unconditional love. That's the love that I, uh, I grew up with uh, from my dad. It, he might not understand, but if I did it, it would be okay because I'm his daughter. And I think that's a message that God gives to each and every one of us. No matter what we do, no matter how bad, quote, it may look in someone else's eyes, and we might think it looks bad in God's eyes, no matter what it is, God will always love us. There is nothing, nothing that we can do that will separate us from God's love. God will always love us. And I have that conviction, that, that uh, belief, that certainty from my dad. Well, the, the topic that we have, um, that has been chosen for us tonight is the place of gays and lesbians in the church. And when I was thinking about this, I, I, you know, I said to myself, well, now what, what is the place of lesbian and gay people in the church? Not just my church, you know, in any church, in any Christian church, in, in, the, in the Jewish community, and um, whatever faith tradition we happen to, to come from, what is that place? And speaking from my own, my own church, I, I, th I would say, where we are today uh, in, in, in our development, in our, in our history, the place of GLBT people in religious organizations is really front and center. When we read the newspapers, you know, look on TV or the, search the web or, or uh, you know, all the, the media, we see the issue of homosexuality and um, is transgender issues coming to the fore. So the place is, is right out there. If the church, if, the, if our religious organizations are to be uh, embrace what's happening in the world, the place then for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered persons is front and center in any religious organization. And I think what GLBT people have to contribute is on two levels. First of all, the individual level for themselves in their respective religious tradition. And secondly, in the, the wider, um, their wider religious tradition. And I'll, I'll explain that a little more. In the individual person, the place that he or she plays as a GLBT person um, is to become a mature Christian. Now, this really holds for all of us, but it holds especially the, the um, lesson or the, the witness that we have from GLBT people to give to all of us. The, the place that, that the GLBT person has is to be a mature Christian by following one's own conscience. And so I want to talk a little bit about that moral discernment, how one comes to follow one's conscience. And we each, I think, I hope, have personal stories that we will share um, in a little while. Coming to that place of making a moral choice, discerning what one should do with one's life or in one particular situation is not a simple task. And I have come to, to identify at least that I have named about seven areas that we need to look at. And there may be more, but at least I have uh, focused on about seven areas. First of all, I think in considering what one should do, 
um, in a particular situation. If we are part of a faith community, then we consult that faith community. And the faith community has usually, in the Catholic Church, we call it a body of teachings. And I've come to n d dislike that word intensely because the word teachings has been used almost like a club against people. But the word teachings is a good word, uh, if, you, if I can get it away from the emotional baggage that I have placed on it. But I, so I, I kind of say to myself, the, the faith community has given some guidelines I'd like that word better because it doesn't have the emotional baggage for me that the word teachings has. But there are some guidelines that come from the wisdom of the community. And so whatever faith that we happen to be, there's history behind us. There are good people who have gone before us who, because of their lives and the struggles that they have come to, that have, they have passed on to us some wisdom, some some guidelines that say, well, this is the way to go. Now, if it's a, a lesbian or gay person in my particular church, the Roman Catholic Church, the guidelines of the community are very, um, I would say, non-affirming. But part of that um, uh, task, if you will, that the first, I think, of our assignment in coming to a, a moral decision in a mature way is to look at the guidelines of the community, of the past, and the present. And when we look at the guidelines in the, in the Christian community, not just the Catholic community, but in the Christian community, um, the uh, official position of the Christian churches as I said, is very negative, and John articulated that earlier, so I'm not going to repeat it. We know it. Um, but we also need to consider guidelines that are coming from the Christian community uh, that may not be from official sources, or in the Catholic community we say they're not magisterial sources. But we look at theological development. And most Christian theologians today, whether they're Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, or whatever Christian denomination, most Christian uh, theologians today uh, disagree with the official positions of their churches. I don't know if you knew that from your reading, but most Christian, most, I'm not going to say a few or many, I'm saying most, did you get that? Most Christian moral theologians today differ from the what their uh, church articulates. And they would say in the context of a loving relationship that sexual expression can be morally good. If there's love and uh, unselfishness and devotion and uh, attached. So, in if I were a you know a lesbian or gay person uh, trying to make a moral decision about my life, I need to be aware of that. So that's the first thing: the guidelines from my from my faith family. The second thing I need to look at is what do my holy writings tell me? If I'm a Christian, what do the scriptures have to say? Well, we know that the, the, the right uh, fundamentalists, and I guess I am using that in a pejorative sense, but the fundamentalist approach would be to bring out some scripture traditions that, or scripture passages that are very negative toward a lesbian and gay persons. But again, looking at scripture in, through a modern lens with modern scripture scholars, the modern scripture, the today's scripture scholars point out that those texts are culturally bound and that the writers of those texts, the negative texts, did not have the information that we have today. The writers of the scriptures thought, you know, when these scriptures were written over 2,000 years ago, did they understand that there was such a thing as a homosexual person? They thought everyone was, what? Heterosexual. And that um, if, you, if you weren't, there was some kind of, uh, you know, an aberration. But the, the third 
point that we need to know or that we need to look into in our moral development is what are the scientific findings and what scientific findings do we know about homosexuality? Uh, here I should, here's my, my teacher coming out. Okay, I, I want somebody to, uh, to answer my question for me. What scientific findings do we know about homosexuality that would uh, question the interpretation we give to some of those scriptures today? Right, that um, I won't, wouldn't say inborn, but it is so part and parcel of a person that it is natural to that individual. That for X percentage of the population, that is their, their natural uh, inclination. Yeah. Sure. That there are, if we study all of the um, uh, mammalian species below the, the human species, uh, each of the, the species there are uh, within that species some who will engage in same-sex behavior and some who even, um, you know, we, we know that there's um, more than behavior, there's this emotional content involved. Good. Uh, anything else that we know from the sciences? Uh, uh, as far as, as we know, that we don't have that many cross-cultural studies, but as, as much as we have, that seems to be the case. That's right. Uh, what else do we know from our scientific findings? We, um, there, um, we know, uh, or at least we think we know, um, that we cannot... Um, change a constitutional homosexual um, person, that there is some flexibility in terms of our orientation, but basically we are who we are, okay? We are who we are, and it's good, and that's the way God made us, and God made us good. So we look at our guidelines, we look at um, our writings, we look at scientific findings. We look at world events, and in our world events today, we see that the churches are re-examining their positions uh, on sexuality in general. That, that's very telling, all right? We look at our own um, ex experiences, our own feelings. Uh, we use common sense. That's what I like to say. We use common sense. And do, does that, what does that common sense tell us? What do our experiences tell us? And also, um, in my um, opinion about forming some kind of moral discernment, we talk it over with people. I like to say we go to a wise person and, or persons and, and talk things over. And finally, when we've done all of this homework, all of this homework, then we come to our sacred space where we are alone with God and we make a moral decision about what direction we feel God is calling us to. I'd like to share with you a little from my story because um, as was alluded to in, in the introduction that, that John gave you, I um, had a little run-in with the Vatican and um, I had been in this ministry for a number of years, and while the religious community leaders, I was a school sister of Notre Dame at the time, I'm now a sister of Loretto, but I was a school sister of Notre Dame, and the religious um, leaders were very supportive, as I mentioned, when I met that young man at the university in 1971. And consistently, through different leaderships both on in the American scene and then we had a, a superior general in in Rome and um, they were very supportive despite getting complaints from bishops uh, here in the United States who would then write to Rome and then Rome would contact our Roman um, leaders but at any rate they were very supportive in fact, uh, on three occasions, the Vatican had asked my leadership to 
um, investigate what I was doing. Now, if you, how many here are, are Catholic, by the way, or come from a Catholic tradition? Oh, good. So uh, uh, at least hopefully you'll, you understand that in, in Catholic political life, and there is politics in any church, um, in Catholic political life, when the Vatican wants something done, they will usually ask uh, a lower authority to do the work. I mean, in common parlance, we, we, we say, well, they ask somebody else to do the dirty work. So they had asked my religious superiors to uh, investigate me. And this happened on three uh, occasions in 79 and a couple times in the early 80s. And each time my religious community leaders sent back a report saying, like, job well done. You know, she's, she's not doing anything that the church shouldn't be doing. In fact, we would, we would uh, recommend that more people be involved in this, in this ministry. She's doing a great job. Basically, that's what they said. So the uh, answer that they gave was not really what the Vatican wanted to hear. So in, in 19, um, uh, well, in the late 80s, they appointed a commission. They said that they were going to investigate me themselves. So uh, it, it took a while for this commission to get off the ground because we had a little political thing going behind the scenes. But uh, finally, the Vatican did render, um, well, right before the Vatican rendered a judgment in 1999, um, the um, leaders who were in my community at this point, because there was an, uh, this now had gotten to the level at the Vatican called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And those, uh, well, those of you who are Catholic may know that the current pope um, was Cardinal Ratzinger, who was in charge of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And so when it got to that level in uh, church politics, uh, the leaders in my community, the School Sisters of Notre Dame, said, well, maybe you should go into another ministry. You know, they, they really supported me all through these years, despite uh, opposition or criticism you know or challenge from some other sources but when it got to that level they thought well maybe I should go into another ministry so I found myself really facing um, a situation where I had to make a moral decision so I kind of went through these points that I have shared with you and um, in going through each of those points like my experience uh, told me that this was a good thing um, my the the guidelines of my church certainly said that um, well the the guidelines coming from from the authorities in my church were suggesting that I go in another direction and yet when I read scripture um, I realized that Jesus um, at times did not do what the religious authorities of his day suggested although at times he did so there's you know there's no clear-cut answer there you you have to sift it out for yourself and when I thought of um, you know the events in the church I I felt that the uh, lesbian and gay community has not had a voice and that there needed to be a public voice for an advocate for lesbian and gay people so the, uh, the so the events in my church were suggesting you know that I go in a certain direction my common sense said here is a group that needs uh, to be represented I consulted wise persons um, but in the final analysis you have to go to your God alone I mean you have to wrestle with these problems and you talk it over with God and I made a number of retreats but one was very significant that I'd like to share with you in Baltimore, where I was living at the time, there's um, a Carmelite monastery. And I was making a private retreat there at the Carmelite monastery. And I was, I won't say I was jogging around the grounds. I was really walking briskly, you know. <laughs> I, um, and so I um, had on my tennis shoes, and I'm walking along as fast as I could. And I, I was looking down at these shoes, these white tennis shoes I had on, and I started to meditate on these shoes. And I thought, um, you know, these shoes aren't the usual 
clunky kind of Birkenstocks that I wear. And if I did wear those clunky Birkenstocks, um, well, I could still walk, um, but I wouldn't be able to walk as fast, and they, I'm, you know, because they don't have uh, backs, and I'd probably slip out of them or something. Um, sometimes, not many times now, but sometimes I would wear little heels, high heels, and if I had shoes on that had heels, oh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd stumble along there. But I thought um, I could walk in shoes that were not designed for running or jogging or walking briskly. I could walk in shoes that were too loose or too tight or with too high a heel. I could do it. I could. So I compared this to what I was being asked to do by my religious superiors. You know, could you go into another ministry? I could. I could go back to teaching mathematics. I could work with women in shelters. I could, um, there were many things that I could certainly do. Just as I could walk in these other kinds of shoes. Then I looked at my shoes and my feet and I thought, well, what would happen if I walked in my Birkenstocks or my high heeled shoes? I could do it. But if I did it for a long time, it would probably have other repercussions on my body. Maybe my back would get out of whack, or my, or maybe I'd stumble along the way and trip and you know break a bone or whatever. I could do it, but it wouldn't be the right shoes. It's it's not good. It wouldn't be healthy for me in the long run to do that. And so I thought of that in my situation. I could do another ministry, but spiritually, I don't think it would be healthy for me to go into another ministry. I, I still felt that God called me to be an advocate for lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgendered persons. And so Actually, I think that was one of the first times in my life that I had to make a conscience decision, a moral decision, because I had been so used to doing what higher authorities told me to do. And it's not easy to go against a higher authority, whether it's a church authority, whether it's a medical authority or a, a legal authority, or uh, because authorities are authorities they have weight you know that you you respect them but i i felt i believed in my heart of hearts that god was asking me to go in a certain direction and so those shoes became for me a metaphor i call them god shoes i think every one of us has to find our god shoes the shoes that fit us the right way and they might not be somebody else's God shoes that you know somebody else has different God shoes they have a different ministry or a different calling or uh, you know whatever it is but we each have to find our own God shoes and to me that's what it means to make a moral decision find your God shoes do what you feel God is calling you to do and so this is the individual part of what I feel the place of lesbian and gay persons is in the church. The individual role, the, the important place is to, for lesbian and gay people to find their God shoes. But there is also a place for lesbian and gay people in the wider church, in their wider religious faith tradition, because it is critical for any church organization to have people of principle, to have people of courage, to have people who are willing to stand up in the face of maybe opposition, terrible opposition, but who are willing to stand up and say, this is what God calls me to. It may not be what God is calling you to, but this is my truth, and I need to proclaim it. I need to say it. And so that courage 
that individuals have to stand up and speak their truth eventually enables the whole faith community to move, to change, to grow. In the Catholic community, we talk about development of doctrine. How does it come about? Now, granted, it takes centuries, but how does it come about? It comes about because first one person and then another and then another is standing up and proclaiming their truth. And that truth may be different, often is different from what has been the established truth. Now, it's true that I could stand up and proclaim my truth and, and maybe it doesn't resonate with the rest of the community, but we leave that to the Holy Spirit. You know, development of doctrine takes place because the spirit is within the faith community and will recognize the truth of, of the individuals as a collective body. So what I'm saying is that we each have a responsibility to ourselves for our own integrity to become moral Christians or whatever faith we are, to become moral uh, adults in our faith tradition to make our conscience decisions. And then that making of the decision and standing up and proclaiming it may serve, hopefully does serve, the wider church to move, to develop its doctrine, its teaching, to, to grow as a faith community. So there are two dimensions, the individual dimension and the, the wider community dimension. Does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? Okay. So. I just I want to close so that we can uh, have a little time. You know, I told you I can go on and on, but I, I want to have some time for dialogue. But I want to close um, by sharing with you a poem. And maybe, well, some of you have heard um, the poem "Footprints in the Sand." Okay. Well, I, there's a companion poem, and maybe some of you have heard it. And maybe some of you haven't. You know, the the poem about the footprints. You know, you go along the sand, and there. Uh, some other footprints there and anyway um, I have another poem I'd like to share with you one night I had a wondrous dream one set of footprints there was seen the footprints of my precious God but mine were not along the sod but then some stranger prince appeared, and I asked my God, what have we here? These prints are large and round and neat. Dear God, they're too big for feet. My child, God said in a very somber tone, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused. You made me wait. You disobeyed. You would not grow. The walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired. I got fed up. And there I dropped you on your butt. And so, in life, there comes a time when one must speak and one must climb, and one must rise and take a stand or leave your butt prints in the sand. <laughs> and so, the moral of this poem is stand up and speak your truth. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to have some time for um, uh, sharing. I'd like just for two minutes for you to turn to the person next to you and share some story, some story of 
your um, knowledge of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered people, some, some story about making a moral decision that was maybe very difficult for you, some maybe sharing even some moral discernment that you're going through. Just very briefly turn to the person next to you and you have two minutes and then we're gonna have a, a, a big sharing. Okay, your two minutes are up, and I know you're just getting started. Well, we can continue later, but what we'd like to do now is to share with each other, share our stories, or if you have comments, or questions, or whatever. I don't know, is that mic working over there? Uh, if, if not, then people can just stand up and you have to shout, unless I can get this down. Um, okay, who's gonna be first? Does, is that working, Pat? Is it? Okay, there we go. Or you could run it around and hand it to Oh, people. I could do that too. Yeah, you want to be in charge of the mic. Okay, I'm the, I'm, the mic mic, I'm the mic person. My name is Heather Brum, and I'm a part of Belonging. Um, and um, I did not grow up Catholic, but I am a, a theological offspring. I was, uh, I'm a Methodist minister's daughter, and that says a lot because there's, there was a lot of talk of... Um, I don't know, just things that a lot, you know, just a lot about like what, not, not that I knew the scriptures, but, you know, doing the right thing and being, doing good things for people. And I mean, not that it's uncommon for other people to have that. Anyway, um, I'm married a Catholic and have two children. So the idea is then, how do I, how do I raise kids in a, in, in an environment, in a faith community that is not what I was raised with, similar in many regards, but some things I don't agree with. Um, how do I um, follow my conscience and um, try to support my children in, in going, following their conscience? Um, what tools do I have to, um, where, where do I go for this information on how to do that for myself as well as my children? And how do I support other people doing that? That's, it's not an easy thing to do myself. And, and so anyway, I, I just, um, I saw you three years ago, and I just would appreciate so much your following, you know, your, your story of following your conscience, and I thought, oh, she, she gets it. She, she knows this struggle, <laughs> has been down that path. And so, you know, for me, um, 
helping get you here and, and supporting you, that was a struggle for me because I was rocking the boat. And um, yet, uh, that's part of what I'm supposed to do. Those are part of my shoes, I, you know, the, those God shoes you talk about. I'm, I'm rocking the boat with those shoes and um, that's okay. Um, it doesn't feel good sometimes. In fact, it's scary as hell, but um, that's okay. And I'm trying to get trying to get comfortable with those shoes. I guess, you know, yeah. that's part of it. I'm breaking in the shoes, I guess. <laughs> yes, those shoes have to be broken in. <laughs> <laughs> and I get some blisters and all that. So anyway, I just uh, really appreciate your being here and um, you're such a role model uh, for myself as well as a lot of other people. And I appreciate your being here today. Thank you. You asked, how do, how do we do that, um, make those moral decisions? Because it isn't easy. Um, one thing I, I, I believe we do need support. I mean, in my own life, um, this, I live with this 81-year-old nun um, who really acts like a 50-year-old. But, <laughs> but um, she is so committed and, you know, to justice, and she was a, real, a main support for me through, through the ordeal. So I know the importance of support. So what, we, uh, what helps <laughs> in, in being firm and strong and making decisions that would require courage is to have a support system, a human support system. And the other thing that is very, very important, vital, is the personal relationship with God, the, the prayer, you know. Um, when you're not going through uh, difficult times, well, we, we, need to, we need to pray every day, you know, whether it's difficult times or not. And so then that will sustain you. So I, I always think two things. I need the personal support, the human support, and the divine support. Thank you. Okay, other um, sharings or stories or uh, what did you talk about? Uh, and you can even, um, yeah, line up, so. Uh, my name is Bill Vogel. I just wanted to reflect on a, uh, uh, a newspaper article, or I guess it was a columnist, by Todd Dorman. After the uh, judge in, in Des Moines okayed gay marriage for a day, why Dorman wrote this, this article, and I'm sure some of you read it, uh, and he was really pretty objective about things, and he said, okay, go ahead, Christopher Rance, and all you, re you, you conservative Republicans, you're just going to raise Cain, and man, you're going to run the Democrats out of the state, because some, uh, what do they call them when a judge goes against them? Judge. All right, there you go. Running the court, you know, it wasn't a, dem it wasn't a vote, it was a judge. And two weeks later, uh, he had a column in which he, he was basically, he was moving on. He's going to write for the Cedar Rapids paper now. But in part of that column, he mentioned that he thought he was really going to catch hell from the Iowa readers. And in fact, it was 20 to 1 in favor of his column. Mm -hmm. So if you want to read his column, it was about the same time that that, uh, that judge made the appointment and his farewell one was uh, about two weeks ago. I, I think that climate is really changing. The old gray mm -hmm. hairs like me are going to die sooner than later. <laughs> and it's just going to be a whole different atmosphere. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, if you look at um, Gallup polls, too, that you see the, the change of attitude. We have our Oprah Winfrey back there. <laughs> I'm Gloria. Um, it takes a lot of courage to speak up when the, you know, the, the yeah. vast majority, it feels like, wants you to be quiet and complacent and just, um, just be peaceful and, and ladylike. And uh, I remember in graduate school, it was, might have been 1979, I had to take a course um, called Action for an Alternative Future. And I wondered what in the world would be the content of that course, but the title alone is just enough to keep, to stay with me through all these now decades that mm -hmm. I, I realize that if we're quiet and peaceful and ladylike, at least for half of us, um, mm -hmm. that we're not going to have an alternative future. Things will be just the way they've always been, mm -hmm. and if we don't like it, we have no one to to be responsible about that except ourselves because it's it's too easy to just sit down and have another cup of tea and and just talk mm -hmm. about how awful it is we have to be willing to step up and and actually do something about it take some action 
go places and talk to people and uh, um, vote and be mm -hmm. political and and uh, talk to people at church because those are people who who usually care about these things and be willing to um, to cause some raised eyebrows and uh, because you may find that there are other people who share your view but who were too afraid to speak up until they knew that someone else shared it so that's right. I you, think you that's important. By your speaking up, you give courage to others to speak up, too. And if you don't speak up, remember, you're going to find your butt prints in the sand. God's <laughs> just going to drop you on your butt. Um, hi, I'm Kit. Um, perhaps the best example of what Gloria was saying was before this, the, there was a viewing of the documentary that you mentioned. And it largely didn't happen. <laughs> For some reason, the video had been lost, and there was a room next door full of people, and we basically all sat there for a half of an hour looking at the front of the screen, and, and nothing. <laughs> um, nothing happened. I Finally, when I thought, you know, maybe something should happen, and I asked about it, and some people started finally... It was more than an hour later, but some uh, eventually in the last half hour they found a uh, they found the copy that was supposed to be played, and they finally started showing it. But um, we were talking about and noticing that we just all mm. sat there. It, we did, we got there we're, late. Right. It was we're ten so after, to be passive. and we sat there and we sat there, mm -hmm. and largely a whole room of people sat there and mm -hmm. did nothing and uh, I made the comment which is more apt now than I think it was even a few minutes ago was that this is why no revolution happens here mm -hmm. <laughs> we sit and wait for the good things to come right right get off your butt huh <laughs> uh, my name is Roger and um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the possibility that we'll change the system so that anybody who wants to form a partnership, be they gay, lesbian, or straight, can do that, and uh, that would be sanctioned by the government. And it would come with all of the rights that we now grant persons who are married. And uh, those persons who are then sanctioned by the state to be partners in a civil union or whatever, could then go to their church if they chose and uh, have their marriage blessed by their god or their priest or whatever. Um, do you see that coming? Is that um Yes, I, I see that coming. In fact, <clears throat> it's here in some places. I mean, we know that some states already uh, have sanctioned same-sex uh, marriage. Um, and some religious uh, traditions, some uh, faiths do bless uh, union, same-sex unions, um, but not the um, not the larger states and not the larger religious traditions. But to answer your question very simply, do I see that coming? Yes. Can I tell you when it's going to come? No. You know. Um, my concern. My concern is that um, married people acquire more than a thousand rights mm -hmm. by federal law. Mm -hmm. That no matter what you do with um, you know your lawyer and, and um, domestic uh, partnerships or whatever they're called, civil unions, you don't get those rights. And um, so we need... But we in need Massachusetts, you know, or any state that will pass... What, what was the, another Massachusetts state? has a state law that right. allows gay and lesbian persons to marry, right. but that doesn't have anything to do with the thousand, of ri thousand of rights that they are not given through federal government. Oh, the federal government. Okay. Um, uh, again, just to, to answer your question, you know, simply, I do see that coming. The trend is that it will, will, it will come, but I, I don't know, um, I, I mean, I cannot uh, say when, uh, I don't know when, but I think we're on the move. I mean, when I was um, younger in, the, in this ministry, I mean, I never thought I'd see the day that we would be talking about same-sex marriage, either in the civil arena or, or in religious uh, circles. And yet, we're talking about it, you know? And the latest Gallup poll for Catholics 
um, it's for, like 47 or 48 percent of Catholics in the pew are approving of same-sex unions. Now, when the question is asked, do you approve of same-sex marriages, it drops like 20 percentage points. But the point is, we're talking about it. And the uh, percentage of, of persons, whether they're Catholic or, or not, keeps rising uh, as we take these Gallup polls, you know, year after year or decade after decade. So the trend is uh, toward the liberalization and acceptance uh, of same-sex marriage, both in, in church and society. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't know statistically how, uh, to, enough to, to predict how long that might take, but I, I, I see it coming. And also, I should say, I'm always hopeful, you know. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on what Roger said, just to, because uh, I, I have uh, thought about this too in that in that respect, and I, I see some changes coming. In fact, just not long ago, uh, my pastor, I'm a Lutheran, and uh, mm -hmm. we're struggling with this uh, thing. We've we've come a long ways as That's far right. as accepting gay and lesbians as members, full members in our congregation. The, the one thing we haven't achieved yet is we we ordain. Uh, gay and lesbian pastors, as long as they remain celibate, we're trying yes. to break through that and, and get the rules changed so that partnered gay and lesbians can be ordained. Mm -hmm. then, then we'll have come all the way. But, but my pastor not long ago said we were talking about marriage. In fact, every pastor that I've talked to recently in my denomination chafes under this business of marriage because we, we are an agent of the state. When I perform a marriage as a pastor, I, I have to, I do this mm -hmm. because that's the law. But he said, I, I'd rather rather uh, have this be a, a civil thing that, mm -hmm. that you go to the justice of peace or whoever and do your thing civilly. And then if you want to come to your church For and have the blessing yeah. of your right. of your church, yeah. then... That's a separate thing. That's that's frosting on the cake, and that would take them out from under this business of of being a agent of the, the uh, yeah. of the civil government, and, yeah. and that that makes sense to me. That way, the denominations and the pastors will have to uh, work that out if uh, if they want to bless a same sex union, they can do so, and if if their denomination isn't ready for that, they they have to work. That's right. Like, Many of us have had to do, but uh, uh, as far as as far as the the whole issue of of the gays and lesbians of sexual orientation, there's there's two things that I spent 35 years as a mental health professional, so I had a lot of professional experience dealing with gays and lesbians, and and uh, have had many friends in the GLBT community. So, and uh, there's two things that have always come up, and when the the other side keeps talking about this is this is not good. Uh, I think the the thing that's very clear, and I would challenge this as I always do any place I am. I believe that sexual orientation is a given. That we we mm -hmm. don't choose our sexual orientation. Everybody in this room probably is like me. When I grew up, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I discovered that girls turned me on and boys didn't, and I didn't mm -hmm. have anything to say. I didn't choose right. that. I, just, I discovered that. Right. And every uh, every gay and lesbian person I've ever talked to didn't choose to be gay. They they grew up and discovered that they were attracted to uh, people of their same gender. So it's uh, this is not something that that the uh, as a conservative say you can you can get therapy and change. I don't believe that. I've 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 never found anybody uh, that nobody I've talked to has ever successfully change through therapy. I don't think it's possible because, because that's the way we are when we're born. And the other thing, uh, I think the, the theological thing that probably you've come through as, as I have, uh, I grew up in a conservative denomination and there were those same seven passages from the Old New Testament right. that says yes. that mm -hmm. homosexuality is a sin and that's uh, taking a, a literal interpretation of scripture in my denomination, most uh, uh, seminar, all seminaries teach the uh, contextual interpretation, which uh, 
for me settled settled the thing theologically long ago. I don't I don't consider that those passages speak as as the they used to say that it they did. Uh, Paul that homosexuality wasn't even even on the radar, right. even a concept until the late 1800s. The word wasn't even, the word isn't in the Bible. <laughs> so, I mean, I think what you're saying is, I mean, I've seen that too, and I believe that if we have more education and uh, about scripture and, and about other, about psychology, I think that, and we have had a lot of education, people have been educated, and that has helped to change people's attitudes, and I think that's what you're saying. And the final thing, I think it's a, I think it's a generational thing. Too. I'm 76 years old, and most people my age would probably be be uh, homophobic. But uh, fortunately, I've got past that well, long ago. Well, good for but, you. <laughs> but all the people, when I talk to young people, they say this is no big deal. You know, it's 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 That's not right. even an issue with them. So, so my belief is that uh, when this generation passes on, uh, it's going to be. It's going to be all over. <laughs> well, like the other gentleman said. Yeah, <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, any other comments, questions, stories? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I was just wondering if you were familiar with the JP2's Theology of the Body, and if you are, what you thought of it. Well, I think it's a, an advance on the part of the institutional church uh, in terms of theology um, to look at... Um, um, sexuality, you know, and, and uh, holding up um, the goodness of the body. Uh, so, like, in general, I think uh, I, I would be, I'm very pleased with his theology of the body. But there are sections of it, naturally, that I, I don't agree with. But I think it's an advancement um, over um, a traditional theology that has emanated from the Vatican. But there are uh, other theologies, and that, that's the, the thing I think that we, that we miss, that we think when a, a church makes a certain pronouncement that like this is the theological position, it is a theological position. It happens to be, you know, because there's politics, it happens to be the theology that's in power at the moment. Um, but other, um, I mentioned most moral theologians, Christian as well, Catholic and other Christian theologians, um, are looking toward um, a, a theology of sexuality and, and a moral theology, not just sexuality, based on relationship. So it's body, yes, but body and spirit and emotion. And like, so it's a theology of relationship and right relationships with each other. And I, so I, I think that's, uh, I, I would be more in favor of that kind of theology. But to answer your question, I think it's an advancement over what the Vatican had previously been. Because previously that the Vatican had concentrated on a action, you know, and not uh, the body, but, but actions, uh, discrete acts. Okay. I, I don't need the mic, I'm loud enough. Well, uh, actually, you, you might, because there might be somebody here like me who's hard of hearing. <laughs> that works. Um, pretty much, I'd like to say thank you for your work with New Ways Ministry, especially. Mm -hmm. um, I, as several people here know, had left the Catholic Church for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the symposium, oh. this last mm -hmm. one, um, that, that was interesting finding out about it through my mother. But um, she and I went and coming back from that, I had a renewed spirit. Great. Uh, even though we were denied the full liturgy, mm -hmm. I, th I personally think that the ritual we went through was much more Richer. profound. That's right, yeah. Um, I, I liked it a lot better myself. Yes. So yeah. thank you for your work with them. Oh, you're welcome. Um, th this is an organization that I and uh, the priest that I was working with, Father Nugent, we co-founded um, a number of years ago. So, oh, okay, go ahead. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Brian. I'm a senior here at Iowa State. And uh, <clears throat> I grew up in a very conservative Catholic area, mm -hmm. two miles, I mean, not two miles, two hours west of here, you know, in a place where, like, even the word, like, homosexual or gay was never even uttered because it was such a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I moved away. I came out. 
all that good stuff. And so I guess I'm kind of what you call a recovering Catholic. Mm -hmm. Good. We got a lot of them. (laughs) (laughs) But I think from a conservative background, I can, you know, I, you know, super religious background, I can see just the total hypocrisy of what Christianity is about and how it's being applied. But in the same sense, I can feel some pride in knowing that we are the religious right's biggest fundraiser. Mm -hmm. You know, all they have to do is mention homosexuality and the money pours in. So uh, I guess, and that's just my comments, but I have a question is that, you know, you mentioned that like theologians and like yourself and, you know, the, your the people in your order mm-hmm. were very supportive, supportive of what you started doing. Mm-hmm. Um, is that pretty common amongst them? I mean, you go higher up and like the bishops and the cardinals and the pope and everything or, you know, ooh, gay is bad. But you get down like in the trenches. Mm-hmm. I mean, is it more, people are more open to it? Yes. Um, I'll tell you the trends that I have seen in the Catholic community since 1971. Uh, In 1971, when I met that young man at the university, um, you wouldn't see the word homosexual, gay, forget, but not even homosexual in any Catholic newspaper. And and what I call the middle management in the church um, were kind of, um, you know, a little leery. I remember in 1976, was it, yes, 1976, uh, at the first call to action meeting, which was really was called by the United States bishops. It was a celebration of the bicentennial of our country. And there was this big meeting in Detroit. And there were like um, a thousand delegates that had been sent there by, um, by the diocese, bishops in the diocese. And then there were 2,000 observers and um, uh, and I was there with the Peace and Justice Group, and uh, at one of the sessions, um, we were the Peace and Justice representatives were sharing with each other what we were doing, and the Peace and Justice Group that I was with was the Quixote Center at the time, and um, we talked about this new project that we had, which was outreach for lesbian and gay Catholics, and these are Peace and Justice people in 1976. Well. There was like silence after that, you know. Um, th- th- like they, they said, oh, well, mm, that's nice. But, <laughs> but um, what I'm saying is like in the 70s, this was a, a new thing, you know, in, in the Catholic community. Um, like another example, I, I would come back from the university and I, I said my leaders were very supportive because they were women really knowledgeable and women of vision and they read and they, they supported. But the sisters, like the grassroots sisters, they were a little nervous, like, what's she doing at the university, you know? And when, I, when they heard about, like, New Ways Ministry, one of the older sisters at the mother's house said, oh, I think I like the old ways better, you know? <laughs> but um, by the 80s, early 80s, there was a distinct change, both in my religious community, um, which, like, the grassroots sisters at a big meeting announced it from the stage that this is a ministry of our community. It was kind of embraced. And you began to... Um, have um, uh, um, like retreats now for lesbian and gay Catholics. So there was like a distinct change in the early 80s. And by the 90s, you know, what, what I, uh, see, oh, in the 90s we began to see very gay-friendly parishes. You have one here, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas. Well, there are hundreds now across the country. What I'm trying to give you in like in a nutshell is the change uh, in the Catholic community toward this issue that has it's become much more open and accepting on the parish level and even some dioceses there are about 24 dioceses that have ministries Catholic dioceses um, and uh, among uh, um, like priests and religious there's much more openness the the most accepting I would say are the nuns I say it proudly um, but the uh, the women in the church uh, ha- are are very open, and it probably you know, well you know if we we know the literature and we study you know uh, research on homophobia, we know that women are less homophobic than men. That might have something to do with it. Uh, but at any rate, um, uh, there is great acceptance on the grassroots level. People in the pews more than you think. As I said, you know about fifty per- almost fifty percent will support same sex unions. Um, uh, acceptance on the uh, in the pew and what I call middle management. When you get up to um, the level of the of bishops, there's been a regression. 
just as in the Catholic community, uh, the grassroots and the middle management have progressed in openness, the hierarchy has regressed because there are different individuals now in those positions and they've, by and large, most of our bishops, Catholic bishops in the United States were appointed by John Paul II and uh, there's been a swing in the hierarchy to go back. But when I say find support, um, uh, you, you, you can find parishes, you can find uh, Catholic lesbian, um, Catholic um, lay people, you can find Catholic nuns and priests who are very supportive. Okay? Thanks. And you find them. Okay, well, I would say um, I would like to continue dialoguing with you, maybe on a one-to-one. -one. And um, the, the, uh, our hosts have graciously provided us with some nice uh, cookies and, and refreshments. And let's continue sharing our stories and our, um, our decisions and our questionings with each other. And just stay as long as you want. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, this is for you, for coming. <laughs>